Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we are bringing you part three, finally, in our Aeon Trustpass Odyssey instructional series. The channel has been going through a lot of changes. I've been going through a lot of personal changes with my career, and so things have really gotten off the rails on the channel. But today, we're gonna to be making efforts to get back on track, finish Aeon Trustpass Odyssey, and work through my backlog of games that I need to make videos for. Now, if you didn't watch the first two parts, part one covered the basics, part two covered the voyage phase. Today, we'll be covering the adventure phase, which takes part inside of the books, the cycle books. This is cycle one, and there are, of course, three cycles with the base game. This will be a six-part instructional series. Be sure to come back for part four, which will cover the battle setup and primordial round. Part five will cover the Titan round during battle, and part six will cover gear, terrain, and ability keywords. The adventure phase in Aeon Trustpass Odyssey is not structured as the battle and voyage phases. There is no strict round sequence to follow, but there are some important rules and ramifications nonetheless. There are at least seven types of adventures in Aeon Trustpass Odyssey, and we'll cover each of them in this video. Story adventures, hub adventures, R&R adventures, inward odyssey adventures, Nemos Breakthroughs, Dreams of Pharaohs, and Special Events. Generally, anything that sends you to a storybook paragraph is considered an adventure. Now during this video, as I flip through this book, I will do my best to minimize any spoilers. And so, for instance, I may stick to this page for as much as possible. Of course, I can't stop you from digging down into this, from pausing it and trying to read through. That's up to you if you're going to do this. Obviously, when you're reading this page, when you're reading paragraph two, you can see all the rest of it. Try to exert some self-control and not actually read it. Now, storybooks contain all the story paragraphs, such as these, as I showed you here, as well as battle setups, such as the Hecaton battle back here on page 108 and 109. All of these battle setups will be specific to Cycle 1, since they are in the Cycle 1 book. Each Cycle storybook will also include Cycle-specific rules that are going to be very important for you to keep in mind up here when you're playing through this specific cycle. As I mentioned before, but it is stressed in the rulebook as well, the most important rule of the storybook is to never read a story passage unless strictly instructed to do so. When you begin resolving a story paragraph, that indicates the beginning of the adventure phase. Anytime you see these white boxes, that's going to indicate some sort of choice or result of what's going on. Many storybook paragraphs will include an outcome pointing you to another paragraph. So for instance here, you can see if you failed this test, whatever it was, go to 0006, if you succeeded, go to 0005. It's also possible a story paragraph may end with the words return to the voyage phase. Or it may simply conclude with no further direction. Either way, this means the adventure is over and you should return to the campaign round step you were on before you were instructed to read the paragraph. It's important to realize the adventure phase ends only if you are instructed to return to the voyage phase or there is no further paragraph mentioned. Once you are in the adventure phase, you must always resolve all chained paragraphs before you can perform any other actions or resolve further campaign round steps. Some of the story paragraphs have choice-based outcomes, as you see here. Sometimes these choices will list some of the gains and losses associated with a given choice. This is intentionally designed to give the player insight into their outcomes, allowing them to make informed and strategic narrative decisions. Read all of your choices and weigh your options. Some consequences of your choices will still remain obscured as they will not appear until the next paragraph in the chain. Some of your choices are only available if you fulfill specific conditions. Even if you do fulfill those conditions, however, you are not forced to choose a given option unless otherwise stated. Some story paragraphs, such as this right here, will instruct you to note down some information. If they specify where to note it, then write it in that appropriate section of the Argo sheet or the Argonaut sheet. Otherwise, simply remember it for the duration of your current adventure. Now let's talk about story adventures. A story adventure is the category that contains all storybook passages in the main story section of the book. 
Usually, you will be directed to them by story or doom cards. Now, it's very, very important to remember that if a game element directs you to a passage without telling you which section you can find it in, you will go into your cycle book and find it in the main story section of the book. So in the case of cycle one, anywhere from page six to page 30 is considered the main story section. And you can see it goes all the way up to 9241 in here. That being said, if you're inside one of these other stories, so for instance, Faded Conundrum on page 31 here, if it says here, look right here, it says C0013. You do not go into the main story and find 0013 and resolve that. Instead, because you are inside Faded Conundrum already, you will go to 0013 in Faded Conundrum. So not the best numbering system there, admittedly. I feel like maybe it should have been all the, you know, all of these inside of Faded Conundrum should have been, uh, for instance, uh, FC0001 for Faded Conundrum 0001. But it is what it is. Anytime you're outside of the cycle book and it tells you to go to a specific passage without telling you a specific section, go to the number in the main story. If you are in one of these side stories and it tells you just to go to a specific number, go to that specific number inside of that side story. Now, outside of the main story, the way you will get to those side stories that I just mentioned will be through your cycle's adventure hub. This is found in the first page or so of the cycle book. Every time you encounter an adventure symbol like this one, that is when you will then go and resolve the adventure hub. Adventure hubs are groups of adventures connected through a common theme with fixed opening and closing adventures that tell a coherent story. To find out which adventure you should resolve, roll a d10. Now refer to the column corresponding to your current story card. So if we are still on story 1A, story card 1A, or even on story card 1B, both of those fall under story 1. We've rolled a 5, and so here we are, 4 to 6. You would then find on your Argo sheet here, play of the people right here, and mark off this first box. If you had already marked off the first box, then you would mark off the next one, and so on until you get to the end. Now, we need to go to Plight of the People. You can see Plight of the People, page 38. If this was your very first time doing Plight of the People, and so you have marked off the Alpha box here, then you must resolve Alpha the Catch, meaning you'd come down here and start reading that story block. Same thing, if you had marked off the Omega symbol, then you would have to resolve Omega here, sowing and reaping. If, on the other hand, you are marking one of the boxes in between Alpha and Omega, you'll roll a D10 again, and we got a five again. So this time, we will resolve four to five, Cult of the Bull. You could mark this box here in the book, or if you want to keep your books as book your books, if you want to keep your books pristine, you can then instead mark four or five here in this box, under the box, however you want to use this sheet to help keep the book clean. Finally, remember to gain any Nemos nodes indicated by your story block. So for instance, here with the catch. Heritage, and we'll discuss Nemos nodes in more detail a little bit later in this video. R&R adventures, or rest and recuperation adventures, are indicated with this symbol. These are shorter, mostly self-contained stories that revolve around the Argo and the lives of its crew. When you encounter one of these on the map, you'll go to the R&R adventure section, so in this case page 85. You'll roll a d10 on this chart here, and then go to the appropriate story, in my case, seven, Lysistrata. Also, it should be noted, there is no place on here to note an r, &R adventure. And so I would recommend just putting it in the notes section here, unless you want to mark in your book, which you can see I did one time, but I have since decided against that.
This is an Inward Odyssey card. These adventures represent the crew learning more and more about the Argo itself. Each Inward Odyssey adventure will also net you valuable, unique rewards. Each cycle will have its own Inward Odyssey card. This is the Inward Odyssey card for cycle one. And there's always 20 Inward Odyssey adventures per cycle. As you can see, 10 on this side, and then 10 more on side B. Inward Odyssey adventures are directly tied to Argo knowledge. Each time you gain one Argo knowledge, you unlock the next adventure on the Inward Odyssey. You would then locate the Inward Odyssey in the cycle book and resolve whichever one you just unlocked. The adventure will be resolved at the end of your current step. This means, though, that the Inward Odyssey adventures have the potential to trigger during any step of the round. If you ever gain more than one Argo knowledge during a single step, you will resolve all of the corresponding Inward Odyssey adventures one by one. These adventures are your main source of god forms, summonings, and patterns. Once you clear your current cycle and move to the next one, you will change your Inward Odyssey card. Any Inward Odyssey stories that haven't been experienced by that point will be lost forever for that playthrough, of course. Remember, you can always place these tokens on your Inward Odyssey, and every two of them will gain you an Argo level. Very rarely, certain Inward Odyssey adventures may have specific requirements, such as having a certain technology or advancing past a certain point in the game. If you ever meet one of these requirements that you do not yet meet, stop resolving the adventure. Later, when you meet that requirement, you can resolve that adventure at the end of your current step. If you have one of these unresolved adventures and you gain another Argo knowledge, go ahead and resolve the next adventure on the card. Just be sure to make notes of any Inward Odyssey adventures that you need to go back to. On your Argonaut sheet, you have this Nemos section. Nemos breakthroughs are adventures initiated from a Argonaut's Nemos. They're called breakthroughs because they unlock a better understanding of the character and their shrouded past. This triangle represents a breakthrough. During the story step, if all nodes to the left of the breakthrough symbol have been marked, as they have here, and the breakthrough symbol itself is unmarked, as it is here, resolve the associated paragraph. This will be found in the Nemos Breakthrough section of the storybook. It should be noted that Nemos Breakthrough Adventures only involve the Argonaut that the memory belongs to. These are the personal stories of these characters that may influence their mindset to a great extent and define their character. For this reason, it's encouraged that you read the Nemos paragraphs alone. Then, you should decide if you want to read it out loud or just share what you've learned, disclosing as much as you wish and including your own interpretation of these events, tailoring them to better fit your outlook on the Argonaut as you play. After all, these are only faint memories. They don't define you. However, if you wish to read the Nemos aloud to the whole group straight away, that's fine too. Just note that Nemo's Breakthrough Adventures don't have a party leader as it's all up to a single Argonaut. Your main reward for resolving a Nemo's Breakthrough is learning more about your Argonaut's past and unlocking a new Nemo's ability. Occasionally, though, you will receive actual rewards as well. It's even possible that you'll gain a gear card from a previous cycle. If this happens, go ahead and take that gear card overriding the original cycle affiliation. Dreams of the Pharaohs are Dreams of the Pharaohs adventures take you to a mysterious place seemingly outside of reality itself. Alexandria, the day before it was obliterated during the Eschaton. There you will explore its famous library for clues and secrets, both concerning the current cycles as well as Aeon Trespass setting as a whole. Unless otherwise stated, a dream of the Pharaohs is resolved during the story step, just like any other story event. When resolving a Dream of the Pharaohs, you go to the location in the storybook. In this case, page 89. Roll a d10. And resolve the indicated result. The main reward for resolving a Dream of the Pharaohs is cryptic knowledge. It's for you to figure out. Dreams of Pharaohs will also offer more tangible rewards, but these carry with them a peculiar risk represented by the Pharos Delve mechanic. 
When you see the Ferris Delve prompt, start drawing cards from the major trauma deck, adding the numbers in the lower left corner. So, so far we have one and two. After each draw, you may decide to either stop the delve or to continue. If you continue, draw another card. To succeed in a delve, the sum of your cards must be equal to or higher than the delve difficulty, but also lower than 16. So in a Pharos Delve 12, we must get at least 12, which so far we have 9, and also be lower than 16. So in this case, we would have to draw again. And now we have 12. And so we would have succeeded. However, if at any point the total is equal to or higher than 16, you immediately fail. If, on the other hand, you stop drawing prior to reaching the delve difficulty, then nothing happens. You don't fail, but you also don't succeed. And of course, if you do succeed, at that point, you would resolve the success effect. It should be noted that in the standard trauma deck, there are 15 cards. There's a pair each of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and there's a single 8. Special events are a broad category for unique, usually short and one-of-a-kind adventures. There are no specific rules concerning special events when instructed to resolve a special event, Simply find an appropriately named passage in the Special Events chapter of your current storybook, in this case, page 83, and then resolve it. So now let's discuss some additional adventure rules in detail, starting with Nemoses. Although the Argonauts do not remember their past, certain story events and adventures may trigger flashbacks of their defining moments. These fragmented memories are represented by Nemos cards. They not only allow you to learn more about your character, but also unlock particular abilities. These abilities initially will give you level 1, and then you can unlock them further by gathering Nemos nodes, which are tracked here on the Argonaut sheet. When you gain a new Nemos, find the associated Nemos card in the box, and then write its name on an empty space on the Argonaut sheet. Then write the paragraph number, M017, as you can see in this tiny little box, right there, into this box above the first breakthrough. You now have access to the level 1 ability for that Nemos card. This side of the Nemos card is a title, an illustration, as well as some flavor text, or actually a cryptic note that may have some actual indications on the nature of the card. On its front, you'll see the cycle that it belongs to, in this case cycle one, three Nemos levels with a corresponding ability for each, breakthrough paragraphs for each of those levels, skill bonuses here, and the Nemos traits at the top, in this case deed, crime, and tragedy. You gain access to this level 1 ability the moment you gain the card, and will gain access to level 2 and 3 as you unlock more Nemos nodes. The skill bonuses, in this case Fury 1 and Cunning 1, are applied to your Argonaut sheet the moment you gain this ability. So here and here. They are permanent for as long as you have the Nemos card. The Nemos traits have no inherent effect, but are used to determine if you gain a Nemos node from an adventure hub. So for instance, with Faded Conundrum, if you rolled a 5 to 6 and got Stewards, you would see that down here next to Stewards is Crime, which means that you would get a Nemos node for Blood on Your Hands when resolving that adventure. To gain that node, simply mark an X, or fill in, or however you want to mark that first node. It's very important to note that an Argonaut can only gain, it's important to realize that an Argonaut can only gain one node per adventure regardless of the number of Nemos cards with matching traits that they have. So for instance, in this case, Blood on Your Hands and Siren Survivor both have the Deed trait. If they went on an adventure where Deed was listed, then the node must go to the dominant Nemos card. In other words, the Nemos card with the most nodes already filled. 
So Siren Survivor would get it in this case, since it already had three and Blood on Your Hands only had one. However, if there was a tie, the player controlling the Argonaut can choose. It is possible through certain instances to gain Nemos nodes beyond a breakthrough. This breakthrough, by the way, would be marked. But to gain Nemos nodes beyond a breakthrough prior to the story step. In such a case, simply note them on the Nemos track and then resolve the breakthrough during the story step as normal. Only when resolving the breakthrough should you mark the breakthrough symbol. Once you resolve the last breakthrough of a Nemos card, it becomes resolved. This means that when your Argonaut dies or leaves the Argo, this Nemos does not return to the Nemos vault. Instead, it is put back in the game box with other unused Nemos cards. You probably won't see it again. A special type of Nemos resolution is called a catharsis. If you reach a catharsis, you will be given a code, which you will then write in the catharsis box on your Argonaut sheet. Each Argonaut can have a maximum of two Nemos cards. If you are instructed to gain a Nemos card and you are already at the limit, the Nemos card goes to another random Argonaut. If all Argonauts already have two Nemos cards, the new Nemos is instead added to the Nemos Vault. The Nemos Vault is a deck that consists of all Nemos cards you have unlocked during your campaign which are not currently assigned to any Argonaut. Keep it separate from other Nemos cards. You add Nemos cards to the Vault in the following situations. If an Argonaut dies or leaves the Argo for any reason, they return their unresolved Nemos cards to the Vault. Or, as we mentioned with this one, when you gain a Nemos card and all Argonauts already have two Nemos cards each, the newly acquired Nemos card goes to the vault instead. Generally speaking, when a new Argonaut is introduced into the game, and you'll learn how this works soon enough, you will be instructed to assign them a Nemos card from the vault. Aided Nemoses are a different type of Nemos card. They are condensed mental traumas, memories not of particular events, but of the states of your mind. These are always bad and they weigh on your heart, introducing various mechanical hindrances. Each Argonaut can have up to two unresolved Faded Nemos cards at the same time. These do not count towards the limit of your two regular Nemos cards per Argonaut. So in total, an Argonaut could have two Nemos cards and two Faded Nemos cards. Faded Nemos cards also do not count as Nemos cards for the purposes of other effects. When you gain a Faded Nemos, search the game box for all of the Faded Nemos cards associated with the current cycle. You can see the cycle number is in the top right corner here. You will shuffle all of the Cycle 1 cards in this instance and draw one at random. You'll then note this Faded Nemos card on your Argonaut sheet, just like a regular Nemos card. Faded Nemos cards are always gained black side up. This side has the name of the Faded Nemos card, its Nemos traits, in this case, Heritage, Gods, and Fate, just like a regular Nemos card, and a short description right here. There's also a hindrance here, in this case, during the trauma draw, treat danger as one higher, a skill penalty at the bottom, so in this case, will minus one, and this hindrance and skill penalty takes effect immediately. If you ever have two Faded Nemos cards that contradict each other, the one gained earlier, which will be in the higher position on the track here, takes precedence. At the beginning of a hub adventure, each Argonaut with at least one Faded Nemos card with a matching trait gains one node for that Faded Nemos card. This is in addition to any nodes gained for regular Nemos cards. So this now means that a Argonaut can gain up to one node for a Nemos card, and one node for a faded Nemos card. However, they will still never gain two or more nodes for the same Nemos card or the same Nemos type, regular or faded. As you can see, a faded Nemos card has no breakthrough adventures. There's no tag in the bottom left corner here as you see on the regular Nemos cards. Instead, once all of these nodes are marked to the left of the Breakthrough Adventure symbol, it is automatically resolved during the story step. Overcoming this mental hurdle will actually assist your Argonaut in growing. This is reflected by the Trauma Growth Abilities found on the back, the blue side, of the Faded Nemos cards. Each resolved Faded Nemos gives you a positive ability you should write down on your Argonaut sheet under Abilities here, and then return the card 
to the Faded Nemos deck. In the case of Memory of Death, you get this ability. If you fully evade an attack, lose one fate. There is no limit to the amount of trauma growth abilities a single Argonaut can have. And you can even gain the same trauma growth ability more than once and have their effects stack. Adventures in ATO are based around your absolute and informed choices. However, sometimes we're not fully in control. Sometimes it's up to chance and effort. When the outcome of a given choice is undetermined, you will be instructed to perform a test, a roll, or some other activity similar to this. Many adventures will instruct you to perform a test, such as the party leader test Wisdom 7+. Plus. To do it, simply roll a single d10 and compare the result to the difficulty of the test. If the result is equal to or higher, you succeed. If not, you fail. In this case, it would be a failure since the test was 7+. Plus. It should be noted that regardless of what the test difficulty is, a natural 10 is always a success, while a natural 1 is always a failure. Some abilities and game effects may allow you to add a bonus to the test result. Unless otherwise stated, all of these effects must be declared before you roll the d10. Then after the roll, you can increase the result by the bonus. There are two types of tests in the adventure phase, Argonaut tests and Argo tests. This would be considered an Argonaut test. These are performed by a specific Argonaut and are generally associated with a specific Argonaut skill. In this case, Wisdom. In this case, you must increase and in certain situations decrease the test result by your skill value. So if the Argonaut had any Wisdom adjustment here, that would of course, help with this roll if it was a positive number. Argonaut rolls can be re-rolled using fate, just like attack and evasion rolls. Tests that are not resolved by a specific Argonaut are Argo tests and are often found on technology cards. As you can see here, you can save to gain plus one Argo fate when you are about to lose crew during the voyage or adventure phase to test seven plus. These can be re-rolled by raising your Argo Fate instead of an Argonaut's Fate statistic. For all other purposes, they are resolved exactly like Argonaut tests. There are many types of rolls you may be required to make during an adventure that are not tests. An effect may simply instruct you to apply a D10, as you see right here. You then resolve it according to the result. Such rolls are not tests, and their description does not include the word test. These rolls cannot be re-rolled using fate. Occasionally, you may see some choices, tests, and rolls that are marked with the peril keyword. I'm not going to dig through the story and find one for spoiler reasons, but just know that keyword exists. When you see it, this means that the party leader must make the decision, test, or roll without consulting the other players. This literally means no talking or discussing, no meaningful glance, nothing at all. It's completely on the party leader. You may have noticed that the Adventure Hub has this battle terrain here. When you resolve a particular adventure, so for instance, let's say Faded Conundrum, you need to add that battle terrain to the next timeline battle. You should also note the placement instructions, in this case, Enter 3 for the Maze Outcrop. Place this information in the appropriate spot on your timeline, which will be the next timeline battle. It's important to realize this terrain will only affect a timeline battle, not a battle triggered in any other way. If an adventure terrain is already noted for that day, ignore this instruction entirely. During the battle setup of a timeline battle with an adventure terrain, place the corresponding terrain tiles on the battle board after you place all battle specific terrain tiles. This terrain cannot overlap with Titans, the Primordial, or other terrain tiles. Outer 3 means you need to place the tile only within three spaces of any board edge. And Inner 3 means you need to place the tile on any space that is not within three spaces of the board edge. Faded boxes are commonly found in adventure tables. They are used to denote that you have already encountered that part of the story. If you have already marked one faded box corresponding to an adventure and rolled this number again, Check if there is another faded box associated with it. In other words, a second one here next to it. If there is, simply mark it and follow the instructions denoted next to it. 
However, if all faded boxes associated with a given adventure are marked, roll the d10 again and resolve a different adventure instead. If at any point the faded boxes of all adventures in any of the adventure tables have been marked, reset all of the boxes in this table. It should also be noted that faded boxes may also be encountered in some of the paragraphs outside of the adventure tables. These paragraphs will inform you when to mark the faded boxes and may introduce additional effects referring to the number of marked faded boxes. Faded boxes do carry over between all of your playthroughs of Aeon Trespass Odyssey. If you repeat any cycles, do not reset the marked faded boxes. This will allow you to experience new stories and encounter unexpected twists in the narrative. Finally, you may find effects that refer to the least and most likely Argonaut. The least likely Argonaut is the one with the least amount of Nemos cards. In the case of a tie, the one with the least amount of Nemos nodes will be the least likely. If there's still a tie, then choose randomly from the tied players. Conversely, the most likely Argonaut is the one with the most Nemos cards and Nemos nodes. If there's a tie, choose randomly. It's important to remember though, faded Nemos cards and faded Nemos nodes do not count towards this. And that is part three of our Aeon Trespass Odyssey series. Thank you for coming back and checking this out. If you have watched the previous ones and were wondering what in the world was going on, don't worry. We will be working our way through this now. The new way I'm working the channel is I'm going to focus on a single game at a time. I'm going to do a instructional video and then I will do something else and the next one will be an instructional video for that game again. And we're just going to slowly work our way through our backlog with Aeon Trespass Odyssey being the focus right now. Until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.